Let's seriously talk about adulting, parenting, Jordan Peterson, and paranoia. Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel. My name is Brittany Simon. I'm so happy to have you here. Before we jump in, disclaimer, Jordan Peterson is a real person. He has real feelings and real family and real trauma. And he is a person who should be handled with delicacy and respect as a person. But as a thinker, I think he's a little paranoid. I highly recommend old school Jordan Peterson to new school G Jordan Peterson, particularly the Jordan Peterson who created uh, Maps of Meaning. I highly recommend his work there. I'll link the playlist down below. As somebody who goes back and forth, sometimes I like his work, sometimes I don't. But at that paranoia reminds me a lot about my mother and not to be a person with mommy issues, but quite literally, the what happens with this type of paranoia is that it creates sort of a distrust from the person who's interacting with them because it can feel like gaslighting. I'm going to talk about this in the podcast, but I want to make a disclaimer that I do see Jordan Peterson as a real person with real struggles, and I don't want to dismiss those struggles. And I hope in turn that his audience and him can do the same for me. I have managed to really overcome so many of my problems. I have managed to forgive people. I've managed to humanize people to an extent that some people think I'm insane for, but I'm really trying to hit home that I am also a person on the internet who's trying to um, curate a system, the levels, a theory about bubbles, the concept that we're living in different realities, but not like simulation or paranoia, but rather just different life experiences, which convince us that this is how the world is operating. And I really want to push home that like my life is not your life. So when Jordan Peterson says he has an experience with something, that's just his experience. And then there's my experience and then there's people's experience. So again, I'm not trying to make a fight with Jordan Peterson. I'm not trying to disrespect him, but I need to make it clear that I do believe that Jordan Peterson and the thought thoughts he has, the actions he takes, and the energy of paranoia he consistently pushes out onto the internet is causing more harm than good to certain bubbles, but not to every bubble. So obviously Jordan Peterson's work has been amazing for so many millions, millions, millions of people. My family's read his books. We've all discussed them. We're a very big discussion family. We've, we've, we definitely talk about Jordan's work, right? We're not haters. But I do hesitate with trusting him to give out advice outside of his bubble because when he talks to people like me, if I'm listening, well, then he's not, he's lying, but he's not lying. He just doesn't know better. So one of the things that really strikes me as odd as a psychologist, there's, there's two things, I suppose, when I, I look at modern claims about identity. The first is that identity is subjectively defined. I think that is so utterly preposterous. I can't believe that we we're even entertaining it as a culture. It's so idiotic. Now, I know for a fact that Jordan Peterson doesn't quite mean this because identity is in everything. I identify as a Republican. I identify as a Muslim. I identify, I identify. Yes, they're identifying with ideas, but even transness or LGBT is an identity within ideology, but also belief, spiritual connection, depending on how you think of orientation or transness. These things are identities. Even the power we put into the identity of male and female, though inherently rooted in sex, so, so important, biology is so important, it still doesn't take away that after that initial idea, we still put on cultural expectations of those genders because we identify as a specific kind of person. A Muslim man doesn't act like a secular man. Why? Because these are different kinds of men. So when you say, how can I be a good Christian woman? You're asking through these identities, how can I be better as X? This means that identity is so much, it is absolutely what we believe like it is so much more it is not preposterous to think we could self-identify that is literally what we've done forever so I'm going to give him the respect I think he deserves which is to give him the benefit of the doubt um, but to also be okay with the fact that he might live in a different reality than me right that's normal that's that's okay so I just wanted to say that because I know a lot of people come in from Jordan's audience and they might feel a way about how I talk about him maybe Jordan sees this I would love to talk to him I'd love to humanize him but he would need to humanize me in the conversation as well, because otherwise we're not, we're just kind of talking past each other. Before I get into the podcast, I was so eager just now. Let's talk about the tea I'm drinking. I'm drinking my favorite Arabic tea. This is the tea I grew up with my whole life. You can get it on Amazon or at uh, uh, Arabic stores. It's really, really good. One is blended with Earl Grey. One is blended with cardamom. And it's up to you which one you like. I take both of them. I mix them together, put them in the teapot, let it boil because we want a little bit of bitter. And bam. You got some delicious tea. Now, okay, let's get into it. I'm obviously very excited. 
You guys know I am a secularist. I come from a religious background. My parents are immigrants. My parents are Catholic. My parents are into philosophy, reading, introspection, documentaries. As a family, all 10 of us kids were always allowed to give input. We were always asked how we felt about things. I literally have a video of me being like 9, 10 years old and being like, I'm voting for George Bush. And my friend's like, I'm voting for Al Gore. What was that? In the 2000s? I'm in my 30s now. Um, We have lots of open dialogue in my home, except when it comes to LGBT and queer stuff. That took three of my mom's 10 kids coming out as queer to start the dialogue, mostly starting with me because I'm the oldest of uh, seven. So I'm the third oldest of 10. And as the bigger sister, as the second mom, I hold a lot of responsibility in guiding my siblings in a good path. Now, of course, I also get blamed for every mistake my siblings make. It's on me. Which growing up in my home makes sense because we're Middle Eastern, there's like a hierarchy, there's a lot of expectations in the bubble, and there's a lot of parents do no wrong, adults, adults, adults are the wise, are the patriarchs, are the matriarchs. And so there's a lot of, I don't, I take the, I end up getting blamed if my siblings go awry because I was the first to do it. But my parents don't get any of the responsibility, which I think is obviously the cause for a lot of the issues growing up. So my parents were not perfect parents. But they are my biggest fans, like in a big way, and also my biggest attractors. <laughs> they support me undoubtedly. They love all 10 of their kids. They definitely wanted to be parents. And my parents are an American success story. Immigrants coming to this country, having 10 kids, building a business that ended up feeding and clothing all their kids. And they were re- rather successful, especially now in current times. Um, we grew up relatively like lower middle class, but eventually now my parents, I think, are considered upper, upper middle class. But of course, they don't have any kids to take care of now. And then My siblings and I, we did fairly well for ourselves, which I think is major proof that my parents did something right. Their kids are so good with making money. Are we good at saving money? Absolutely not. (laughs) We're not exactly um, money educated just yet. I think as a family, we're still learning how to do that. But one of the things that was so distinct about growing up in my home, in my bubble, is that it felt often like gaslighting was happening. Hence, I think the forming of my borderline as a young child and as a queer kid. I'm currently reading FYI Marsha Linehan's book on building a life worth living. She's the creator of DBT. DBT is the the therapy I got for my borderline that really, really just, it helped so much. Now, I've always worked multiple jobs. I've always been a hustler. I've always been successful in many ways, but I've also been in conflict with myself. I'm battling myself, right? And then existence, the world. So my existing and then existence. Hence the reason that I dived into philosophy. I've read over 2000 books. I'm obsessed with knowledge. I want to be a chronic student for the rest of my life. But when your teachers start to sound a little paranoid, I get a little... mm. Jordan Peterson has this tendency of speaking in a very paranoid way and also reminds me of why as a child I started to distrust authority figures. This, what you're saying here, although it's backed by the literature, it's it's obvious you have an expertise in this area, that this is, this is labeled as transphobic. Yeah, this is yeah. a transphobic Well, it's conversation. even worse than that, you know, because the data, and this was known, let's say, 10 years ago before this all became an issue, Ken Zucker in, in Toronto, he was the world's leading authority on transgenderism, you know, he divided it into two parts. There's the autogynophilic types. Those are the guys who get sexual kicks from dressing up in women's clothing and then go dr- do drag queen story hour. Say, well, we're just, you know, pristine and pure. It's like, no, you're not. You're getting a sexual kick from dressing up in women's clothing. And let's not bloody well forget it. And you can't even say that now, but every clinician worth his salt knew that for decades. And then there's another subpopulation. And those are usually gender non-conforming kids. And, you know, like a conservative skeptic might say there's no such thing. It's like, no, there, there is. So your typical gender non-conforming kid would be, this would be the perfect target for this, would be feminine boy or a masculine girl who's high in trade openness, so has kind of a mutable identity, who's also high in neuroticism. And there's lots of kids like that. And so they don't fit in that well with their peer group. You know, they're tomboy girls or feminine boys. And then if you track... A lot of them, some of them develop body dysmorphia. They're not very happy with themselves at puberty because they don't fit in. But Zucker showed very clearly, he ran the transgender treatment clinic at CAMH in Toronto for decades. And he was one of the world's leading authorities in terms of publication. I think he was the editor of the lead journal for years. They just took him out in Canada, fired him and disgraced him. And he battled on the lawsuit front for like 10 years and was eventually vindicated. But he didn't have a political bone in his body. He was a clinician through and through, you know. He wasn't playing political games, documenting autogynephilia. That was just clinical reality. 
Now it's, it's become verboten to even suggest such a thing. Oh, there's nothing sexual about this. It's like, yeah, right. You're dressing up in lingerie before your mirror at home, tucking your dick between your legs, imagining you have a vagina for a sexual kick. Oh, there's nothing sexual about that. Yeah, right. Bloody absolute liars. Because as much as Jordan Peterson means well, as much as my parents meant well, the moment you start saying things like they are 100% fact and then your kids go out into the real world and actually start popping bubbles and actually start meeting out other people and then they realize like you're wrong, you either one of two things, you're either stupid or you're lying to your kids. Or of course, because I'm nuanced and enlightened, the third option, you're just being a person. Humans are going to human. And in, mo in peak Jordan Peterson moments, he is humaning so hard. The fear, the anger, the shaking voice, the oh, okay, the doubting people is why you can't be trusted. There's no way you can tell me a man who's lived as long as him, who comes to these conclusions about drag queens and LGBT people, is introspective to the level that I am because I know that even though I don't agree with Jordan Peterson's most of his takes, I can still understand why he got there. I think it makes sense that he got there and I know why he's successful in his bubble for getting there, right? I know because I am introspective. Again, I am going to fight on this. I will die on this hill. I know people are living differently in the world. I've experienced it and I am open to however people are living, even if I personally get an icky feeling around it. I know that I could be wrong, right? I'll give an example. Jordan Peterson talks about drag queens and how they're all sexual and how they're deviants and how they're tucking their dicks to get vaginas and all of these things and reading, you know, drag queens reading to your kids is bad and all these things. But again, if you've never met any, if you've only met those ones, if you've only been in certain bubbles, sure, I agree with you. In that reality, absolutely. But the moment you step out of it, that's just not true. I've met so many drag queens. I'm a progressive person, but not quite an SJW. You know what I mean? I didn't vote for Joe Biden and I didn't vote for Trump. But I, I am a person who genuinely thinks we're evolved animals over time, living on a planet and a part of the ecosystem. And we form bubbles and cultures and religions and we do our best to migrate into people, like near people who kind of invite us and welcome us. And then we create an echo chamber, which is fine. I don't care. But it ends up creating a false reality, but it's still a real reality. So maybe in Jordan Peterson's bubble, because he's a therapist, he's over, maybe he's thinking about all the drag queens he had as clients. But the problem is, is like, if you're a therapist, you're mostly talking to sick people. And not all drag queens are sick, right? And then what does sickness mean? As somebody that got diagnosed with borderline, my therapist pretty heavily sure it's because I was a queer kid growing up and basically getting unintentionally gaslit growing up, right? My parents come from a background where they their only interaction with gay people is that they were pedophiles. So of course, growing up, my parents were worried their kids would be gay because they were worried they'd be pedophiles or it meant that they were molested, which from my understanding of my life, I've never been molested. I was assaulted in my 20s, which gave me the PTSD diagnosis. But again, I'm a big proponent of therapy. I love therapy. I believe in therapy. I think you should go to therapy. I also think you should find a good therapist because therapists are people. So if I went to Jordan Peterson and he was my therapist, he'd probably make me unalive myself. If I'm being completely frank, because the way he talks is so paranoid and doesn't coincide with the reality I've experienced with drag queens. Though I know there are sexual drag queens, absolutely, 100%. But there are literal TV shows of drag queens, obviously for the fashion, obviously for the performance, obviously not to get their rocks off, right? But the fact that he can't quite see that, or at least from what I've seen, he can't see it, makes me ponder about his ability to see outside of his bubble, right? And again, I'm not... Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I misunderstood. Maybe, 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 maybe. But again, when you're looking at the world and you're seeing it this way, but then your kids discover it's different or could to be different, all of a sudden you become a liar or a gaslighter or you're just kind of dumb, which is offensive all around. Who wants to call their parent dumb? I don't want to call my parents dumb, but I will say my parents, because of their religious bubble, are not allowed to experience drag queens. They're not allowed to go to a drag show. They're not allowed to see their daughter hang out with her friends. They're not allowed to be happy for me and my queerness. They're not allowed. Even now, I'm marrying a, I'm marrying a man. I'm engaged. I'm marrying a man, and they can't celebrate our marriage with us because they're religious, because we're secularists. And that's fine. But you better have a good reason to say you're introspective, to say you understand people, 
And then to double down and not even engage with other people because they live differently from you. Do you know what I'm saying? It's it's a strange conundrum. Okay. So I'm watching Jordan Peterson. I'm hearing the way he's talking about drag queens. And I'm going, well, of course, that doesn't match up with the reality I've experienced. But sure, that's his. I respect it. Everyone's got a reality. But just like as a woman, when you're assaulted by a man, you can't assume every man is a rapist. Just like you're a man and you get jumped by men, you can't assume every man's going to jump you. Just like when you're a white person who's had a black, a bad uh, interaction with a black person, you can't assume every black person. Just because you're a black person and you've had one bad experience with a white person doesn't mean, okay? There are 8 billion people on this planet. And if you keep thinking that your trauma is everyone's trauma, or if you keep thinking your lived experience is everyone's lived experience, you're going to run into problems, right? If you have a religious person who is religious in a forest and comes up with their belief in God and holds on to that belief in God, does that make it a religion? Let's say you're a child, um, like the wolf girl who was barked at by her dad her whole life. Mr. Wiley? Yes. Why did you keep your daughter in a room? Mr. Wiley has no comment. No comment. We haven't had time to discuss the charge we have. Do you think that that person is having the same experience with life that someone else is having? No. So when you sit there and you say drag queens are tucking their dicks to get vaginas, it's like, okay, sir, yes, some people are having this experience with life, but some people are having a different one. And I am interested in all of the experiences so I can have a real understanding of existence as much as possible, right? I can fully accept that everyone's going to live how they're going to live, right? But I wonder if other people can honestly say the same thing. Now, that does not mean that I personally do not have boundaries with people who live differently from me. I actually do for the safety of both of us. I think we can agree to disagree. I think we can live and let live. I think I can say, hey, I don't really agree with that. I don't mesh with this energy, but cool, you do you. Of course, when I look at Jeannie, I get frustrated and I want to burn the world down. But we're not going to burn the world down because a few million or so people are insane. We're going to be kind, compassionate, patient, and attempt to change the world for the better, which starts with understanding people for exactly how human they are. Because I am a person who is unlike other people, and I know that, I know that because every time I look into your bubbles and you guys give me solutions, they're half wrong. They're not always correct, but you guys take them like 100% correct. You interact with 10 people who who fulfill your preconceived notion of a type of person. And then you go, see, 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 I could do that too. I could talk about men and how shitty they are and how they're all rapists. And I could give you a hundred examples of bad men. Does that really mean half of the world's population is a rapist or is bad or is violent? Aren't men sick of being fucking categorized as these violent people? Then why are you doing it to other people? Because you're afraid because you're just like the progressives you hate, because you're just as damaged as those progressives. And that's why I left the progressive bubble and I left the conservative bubble, because you're all so damaged and you don't want to admit it. Instead of facing your problems, you shove them all the way down. Instead of fixing your problems, you just create new ones and you become more paranoid. It's so interesting to me that the conservatives or the right wingers or the religious will talk about how the trans people and the progressives are corrupting and ruining the lives of their children, which fair. Yes, some progressive parents will ruin the lives of their children. Some people will transition when they didn't mean to. Some people have bad relationships with their bodies because of how they're raised. Why are you discounting how the religious have impacted their children? I literally suffer from a mental illness that I have to struggle with because my parents unknowingly, because of their religion and their values, gave me. Like, they didn't mean to give me borderline. It's not their fault. Thank God my therapist, like, allowed me to humanize them. It's not their fault. But stop pretending like religion hasn't ruined millions of people's lives. And yet, I still think religious people should be allowed to have kids because I think it's our God-given right to have children as it is to bear arms, but it is literally our right to create life. And the idea that you think that these progressive kids are being, all of them are being harmed, but you're not looking at the religious families raising kids and the harm they're doing is so outrageous. Now, the progressives already know that the religious are hurting their children. Some of them, of course, not all religious people. 
But don't worry, the progressives are next. I'm going to make a video about you guys next and how you ruin children as well. Stop pretending like we do not all contribute to the way society is. The longer you are fearful, the longer you are paranoid, the more you will contribute to the detriment and separation of our communities. You wonder why our communities are melting? Because you're all having breakdowns over nothing. Instead of actually tackling the real issues, you're all so distracted with who's the better parent and who's doing this. None of us will ever agree. So we have to come to some sort of general consensus to move society forward. And it does not start with blaming one group over another. It starts with coming together as a community and deciding what values do we have as said community. Those communities could be large or small, but it has to start with a consensus. Life is hard enough. I don't know why you're making it harder, but I'm sure you think the same of me, right? You're thinking, life is hard, Brittany. Why would you make it harder? Why would you want to be queer? Why would you be trans? Why would you reinform your, reinforce your you know, gender affirming things in your kids? Why, why, why? Everyone has a different version of hard. Life itself is basic hard. Food, shelter, water, that's pretty hard sometimes. But of course, on top of that, we have illnesses and mental illness and all these things. Look, I am so, I have spent all of my life trying to understand my parents. And my parents have spent all of their life doing their best to understand their kids, but they're literally limited by their religion. They literally cannot engage in understanding why their kids would do certain things because in order to engage with that thought, they would have to consider that God doesn't exist. And that's the problem with bubbles. It's fine, ultimately, because people are going to people and I believe in free will and I think you should have freedom and I think you should be as chaotic as you want to be. Um, even though I believe in stability and discipline and all these things, I cannot believe in free will and in freedom and then start talking about regulating you, right? So I try to be pretty consistent with my freedom arguments. But I have tools at my disposal that other people cannot have. I wonder how Jordan would change his life if he spent a year in queer positive circles that weren't stupidly annoying progressives, that were more nuanced, more calm, that did have boundaries between kids and what kids should be exposed to. Look, every parent is going to raise their kids differently. You and I are never going to agree on what raising a good kid is, right? Or like how to raise a good kid. There were liberal parents I knew growing up who let their kids watch PG-13 movies with so much sex, so much portification that I was like shook growing up because I was not allowed to watch sex-filled movies, but I was allowed to watch violent ones. Braveheart, Tombstone, classic movies, Gladiator, love those films. For some reason, my parents totally fine with violence. But sex? Mm -mm. Which is interesting, right? You wonder why. Why did you raise your kids this way? I asked my friend one time I was chilling with my friend at her house and we were watching Requiem for a Dream with her parents. And that scene comes up where the two girls have like a dildo connecting them and they're all having sex. And I was like this. And I was like, okay. And I was like in my 20s at the time, but I was like, and I like looked at her dad and I like looked at her mom and I was like, oh, we're really liberal in this house because like my parents don't even watch sex scenes now and they're in their 60s. They don't watch sex scenes. My parents are super religious. They're not going to do anything to tempt to sin. They're not going to do anything to tempt their God. Right. So they can't, because of their limitations, engage with their kids in a real way because they'll never be able to handle the details, which is so interesting. And then they consider themselves the ones who have the right answers when they don't even want to go to hell and back the way their kids have to go. So again, Jordan Peterson, a person who went to hell and back in his own way, for some reason cannot give that to somebody else, cannot say, oh, you are also going to hell and back. He just assumes the worst. I wonder if he spent a year, like I said, relaxing with cool people, doing cool things with chill people in a way that mostly aligned with his beliefs, would he change his mind? Because the truth is, is like there are conservative drag queens. There are conservative trans people. There are conservative all kinds of people. And maybe those are the people you should be hanging out with, which would ruin your argument that drag itself or trans itself or gay itself is the problem. Because really it comes down to preferences of understanding. I understand the world this way. So that, you know what I'm saying? So again, you have to separate it. Are you actually upset at drag people or their politics, right? And again, maybe you're just upset with dragness, but then what you're saying is you're upset with people putting on costumes. Have you ever been to a cosplay convention? Because those are fun. But cosplayers do drag. Now, it's not the same bubble because drag is very specific, but cosplayers gender bend, right? Because they're costuming. If I was going to cosplay as Vegeta, 
but I did girl Vegeta, right? Or maybe I just did Vegeta and I cross-dressed in that way or cosplayed in that way. I know these are different bubbles, but ultimately you have to dissect yourself. Are you upset because adults are wearing costumes? Are you upset because when they wear those costumes, you think they're always sexualizing themselves and or children? I want to know because, again, my reality is different. I'm having a different experience. Yes, I've met some sexualized drag queens, of course, drag kings, of course. But most of the time, it's pretty basically costume design, even burlesque. Lots of people won't understand the idea that burlesque isn't quite sexual. I was going to an international burlesque competition as a viewer and these guys behind me were like, oh, I can't wait to see some tits, bro. And I just like turned around and looked at them. I was like, you are so gross. Like you're not classy at all. Burlesque is pretty classy. Would my mom be able to show up to a burlesque event? Absolutely not. But one of the contestants had actually brought her mom there. And I was like, man, that's cool. Because yes, when you're watching burlesque, if you are a, a monkey, if you were if you are just uh, concerned about your genitalia, then yeah, sure. Maybe it's only sexual to you. But there's so much more there you're missing out on. It's same thing with BDSM. I've been in BDSM for years. It's all about consent and negotiation in the bubbles I'm in. And I do non-sexual BDSM. I practice non-sexual BDSM when it's about me, when I'm the bottom or the focus. Um, when I'm the top and my bottoms want sex, that's fine. I'm open to sex. I have a partner. We're monogamous. I'm open to doing whatever. But when I'm a bottom and I am in BDSM, I don't bring in sex. I don't want my genitals touched. I don't want sexual arousal. I don't want orgasm. I want discipline. I want meditation. I want growth. So again, I am, I'm really not trying to attack Jordan Peterson here, but he reminds me so much of why I think people don't make good parents. Not that I don't think you're like a good parent. I think everyone's mostly good in the world. I do. I know that's not neutral. I think most people are good. They're trying their best. They're really trying. Okay, I've really, I have a great faith in humanity. And at the same time, I just think people are going to do people things and parents are going to raise their kids thinking they're doing the best, but maybe you didn't. Like one of the reasons my partner and I are always talking about, like, are we having kids? And as a person who always wanted six kids her whole life, my autoimmune disorder diagnosis really threw me for a loop about like my body and my life and whether or not I want to force a baby into existence just because I want one and then hopefully raise them well. But him and I have such a standard for parenthood that we don't meet it yet. We just don't meet it yet. And I would like to meet that standard before I had kids. Now, this is a very privileged stance, if you want to use that word. It's a very, I can make my own choices because I never got pregnant young. I'm on birth control. I'm an adult. I make money. I know how to prevent pregnancy. I've never had to have an abortion. I would not like to have an abortion. I never plan to have an abortion. But at the same time, I know that bringing a kid into this world means something. Now, we're also super open to adoption as a couple, and I'm very into that idea. I think that's probably what we'll end up doing and or not having kids at all because we're really focused on the limited time we have on the planet and then the 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 actions we take to influence that planet like that that matters and having a kid is adding another person onto this earth that is going to contribute to that world and so I want to raise that kid ready to contribute good things but at the same time I don't think we're obligated to it necessarily and I'm sure my parents did the same thing and I'm sure Jordan did the same thing and I'm sure I will mess up all the same no doubt I will raise my children and they will hate me for some reason and then it will be a cycle that continues on. And maybe that's the radical acceptance that's like the most real is that no matter what we do in life, we're going to hurt people. No matter how much you try to harm reduce, which is something I really heavily believe in, you will hurt someone. My mother feels hurt that her kids are non-religious or her daughter's on OnlyFans because I think nude art is beautiful and I'm into erotic things and I think there's something beautiful about the world and the human body and so many avenues to explore for me that I want to go down hurts my parents. And that's kind of the irony, right? How hurtful would it be if I gave birth to a child who grew up becoming an anti-sex advocate? That would be so hurtful. But at the same time, ugh, humans are going to human, even my own kids. So again, I'm not mad at Jordan. I'm a little frustrated that somebody who's so interesting and can be so thoughtful is also so scared of the world. But I don't blame you. I'm also scared of the mob. I'm scared of people. I'm afraid. And at the same time, I'm only afraid that I'll be unnecessarily tortured because people. 
I'm not really afraid to die. I'm not really afraid to to exit the world. I'm afraid of existing in a world in which the mob has decided, whether it's our parents or the government or schools, that I don't deserve to exist in a way that is free because they're afraid of me. You know what I mean? I think Jordan feels that fear, and I don't think he wants to admit that he is the cause of it in other people. And I think that's always going to be the irony, is we are consistently putting each other on edge because we don't want to admit that we're afraid of each other. And also, we'd like not to be. I'd really like to not think that Jordan Peterson's fans are going to come say mean things to me or threaten my life, which happens sometimes. It's no big deal. Everyone does it. Every fan group has some sort of toxic person in it. But that's not just coming from anywhere. Jordan Peterson literally has anger in his voice about queer and trans people. If he doesn't think that's going to translate to his audience in a negative way, I'm, I'm not sure what will. He mentioned toxic masculinity versus toxic femininity. Freud was no dummy when he pointed to the fact that the devouring mother was one of the major impediments to proper human development. He knew that, mm. looking deep into the darkest families and seeing this proclivity of the overprotective mother to destroy the developing integrity of the child, to keep the child infantile, to cling to that relationship instead of developing a life for herself and letting the child go flourish. That's Hansel and Gretel, right? Mm. You're lost in the woods. Why? Well, your family's broken up. And you have an evil stepmother, so now you're lost in the woods. What's your abuse rate if you have a step-parent? 100 times normal. So you're lost in the woods. Well, what happens? Well, you come across a gingerbread house. Well, that's pretty damn convenient. You need a house. It's a little, it's more than you could even hope for. It's not just a house. It's a house made out of candy. Well, what's inside a house made out of candy? A witch who wants to fatten you up and eat you. And that's the devouring mother, you know, and that's an old fairy tale. Yeah, no kidding. Yeah, and so, you know, we could, we could dwell on that for a minute too. One of the things we won't honestly discuss in our society, one of many, is the fundamental nature of female political psychopathology. You know, and there's male political psychopathology, obviously. That's what the feminists complain about all the time when they talk about the oppressive patriarchy, you know, toxic masculinity. There's no shortage of toxic masculinity. So is there any toxic femininity? You look as a woman who is a high earner, who is the breadwinner in her relationship, who is a masculine woman in a lot of ways, who uh, is not typical in a lot of female ways. I do believe in toxic masculinity and femininity. We have toxic women. Watch any Disney movie. All the moms are toxic or dead. Like in Disney movies, Toxic femininity is explored countless times. So for the same group of people, Jordan Peterson's bubble, that says Disney is like bad and all this stuff and look at the way blah, 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 blah. Or I should say the red pill people really more than Jordan. Like, ooh, Disney is like making women think they can just be princesses. Disney is also giving us lessons about parenthood and toxic mothers and toxic fathers, but mostly toxic mothers. So we have that experience in media. I don't know why Jordan Peterson doesn't think it exists. It's what we all grew up with in the 90s and 80s, at least. I did. So maybe other people aren't. And again, we come back to bubbles. And again, we come back to we're not having the same lived experience. And we're coming back to we're coming back to we're coming back to. Reality is what you know. And we all know very little. And that's what's so scary is I don't think any of us want to admit, except for me, of course, because that's the premise of my whole philosophy system, the levels and the bubbles, is that we don't want to admit that we don't know. And that's the problem. When you think you have the answer in your bubble, when someone else listens to you, the reality doesn't match. I have a friend, him and I are always arguing in the best way possible about what life was like for the gays in the 80s and 90s. <laughs> He's older. I'm younger. And I grew up coming out of the 80s and 90s and 2000s as a gay kid and only hearing bad things about gay people. No gay representation. Everybody hates gay people. Gay people are dying. All of it. He grew up in a different bubble where gay people were in movies and there was themes and sexuality and all of this stuff. He recently showed me a movie called Crash with James Spader and a whole bunch of other people. Uh, not the racist one, the car one. And in this movie, people get like 
turned on by car accidents, basically. It's really gross. It's interesting, but it's like, it left me with the ickiest feeling of just hating people. But again, I just think it's really like malicious and non-caring and they didn't care about the victims of the car crash. It was a whole thing. But in this movie, like grown men are kissing. Sex is everywhere. This is not the 80s I was raised with. This is not the 90s I was raised with. This is not the world I was raised with. Right? So in his head, he's like, gay people have been in movies forever. There's always been like Hollywood movies that are widely accepted in, in you know. And I'm like, but that's the bubble, right? Because I grew up in conservative California, in Southern California. I grew up homeschooled and then a couple years of public school. I grew up Catholic. I grew up with families that this wasn't talked about. Rosie O'Donnell and Ellen DeGeneres were like scandals when I was growing up. So I wasn't raised in a reality where gay people were accepted. But my friend, who's older than me, has a lived experience of like gay people were normal growing up. And we both come from the same country. How did we how did we just grow up in different bubbles like that? How did we have a literal different reality with this? So in progressive politics, you'll often hear like gay people were never welcome. Trans people are still not welcome to this day. But of course, some people's lived experience is not that. Think about the movie Birdcage. What is that? 1996? Something. 1990s. Birdcage. Love that movie. Such a great movie. Gay couple. But again, I wasn't allowed to see it growing up. I only saw it after I went to my friend who was a liberal, her house, and I was allowed to watch it there. So again, when you're growing up, when you're having a relationship with reality, you only have the information you have. Which is why I will be a chronic student for the rest of my life because I want to know what I don't know. And I know I'll die without ever knowing most of it. But man, I really want to try. So I'm not an idiot walking around saying things like drag queens are all sexual. It's like that makes no sense. But I understand how you got there. Are you open to a different possibility? And that's my really the conclusion to this video is are you actually open to the possibility that you could be wrong, but not even wrong, that there's something you don't know that could help you be have a better relationship with your existing. Because that's what's so interesting. And we're all going to be different. Everyone is going to find joy and love differently. And yes, you can still judge them by your preferences. But do you need to be afraid of people? Do you need to think everyone is a pedophile? Do you need to freak out? Look, if you're a parent and you want to raise your kids watching The Simpsons, go ahead. I am not going to raise my kids watching The Simpsons because they're bratty behaviors, a show for adults, and I don't want my kids mimicking that behavior thinking it's cute. It's not cute. Bratty kids is not cute, okay? And so I'm not going to like expose my kids to that until they're older. Why? Why is a woman who's on OnlyFans, who's queer, who's had, you know, foursomes and all this stuff, who's done drugs, why is she not going to let her kids watch The Simpsons? Because I want to raise my kids with the best possible chance of understanding how to bubble hop how to be mannered around other people, and how to understand their place. You're a child. You are now learning. And when you're an adult, you can be a brat. But while you're representing me and my belief systems, I need you to be well-mannered because we believe in harm reduction here. And you're not going to harm reduce if you're bratting at a supermarket, if you're bratting in front of people, if you just think you're spoiled and you deserve things. Well, that's not going to make a good adult, right? And I think that a lot more conservatives are a lot more entitled than they think they are because you think you have the right to stop people from living their joy. And the only way you do it is usually to paint them as deviants or perverts. When the sex perversion scandals in the conservative bubble are so fucking high, at this point, it, okay, I think it's pretty clear that y'all have enough to worry about in your side of the aisle that I think I would clean that up before I started talking about other people. What does Jordan Peterson say? Like, clean your room before you start examining other people's? Yeah, I think you should take your own advice. I really do. But you can do you, because I believe in free will and I believe in free choice. So you do you. You live your life. You keep pushing your agenda out into the world, and I'll keep pushing mine. But mine is superior to yours, because mine allows you to exist and me to exist. Yours only allows you to exist. And I think you should think about that a little harder. All right, guys. Thank you guys for watching this podcast. I hope you guys enjoyed it. I hope you guys have a great day. And remember, you only have one life and then you die. So please pick and choose what is valuable to you, what brings you your joy and cherish it. Hug your kids. Hug your parents. Hug your loved ones. Because one day, girlies, we're not going to be here. Yeah. All right. Good luck on your journeys. Talk to you soon. Bye. Um, hey, uh, uh, future Brittany here. I just want to say also, 
I did take Jordan Peterson's Big Five. My whole Discord paid for it. We love it. And I think that it's a really fun test and I think you should take it. And I think you should consider how it, how you view yourself and use it as a tool. So again, I really want the best for Jordan Peterson. And I really wished he wanted the best for me. But it's pretty clear that he wouldn't be able to want the best for people that are different from him because he hasn't actually displayed that yet. And I think that's something that he should consider in his work. That doesn't mean his test isn't good. And I do think you should take it. Okay, just wanted to say that. Talk to you soon. Bye. I'm just fine, yet all I do is whine Not to you in my mind, cause I know I don't make sense I've been nothing but blessed So why's my life a mess? Please tell me, cause I'm sick of thinking Yeah, I'm sick of reaching out for the truth And living life as a fool